Hello, and welcome to The Debrief from the Business of Fashion, where each week we go deep on our most popular BOF professional stories with the correspondents who created them. I'm Lauren Sherman. The way that department stores and other multi-brand retailers work has never been particularly favorable to independent fashion brands. The quote-unquote wholesale model, where brands sell their products to a store, which then sells those products to the consumer, allows brands to gain exposure to markets that they might not otherwise be able to reach. But it also means slimmer profit margins, less control over markdowns, and the chance the brand might have to buy back unsold product at the end of the season. During the pandemic, many brands ran from the wholesale market and instead focused on direct-to-consumer sales online. But now, as business booms, many brands are bolstering their wholesale distribution once again. Are things different this time? Today, I have with me retail correspondent Kathleen Chen to discuss how brands are navigating the return of department stores. Kat, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's always a pleasure, Lauren. So let's talk about what's happening in the multi-brand retail space right now. How are things different than they used to be? We're seeing a real renaissance in this space. Even department store numbers are up and it's really, really spectacular because if we take a step back, back to three years ago before the pandemic, we were just seeing steady decline in the space. There was the Barney's bankruptcy and everybody else was kind of struggling. And so when the pandemic came along in 2020, people were like, well, that's the nail in the coffin. There were bankruptcies in the works, foot traffic stopped, department stores couldn't pay their vendors and they were canceling orders. And so brands very quickly pivoted to e-commerce. I did this whole story in June of 2020 about how wholesale brands can pivot direct. And in it, people were saying, this is a game changer moment. And maybe some spoke a little too soon because by early 2021, department stores and multi-brand retailers were ramping up again. People were going back to the stores. At that point, a lot of them were financially healthier. Neiman Marcus had emerged out of its chapter 11, didn't have to liquidate. It was better capitalized than ever. Saks went private and then it spun off its e-commerce arm. And it was controversial at the time, but what it allowed Saks was access to more cash because the spinoff came with an investment. So by the time that 2022 rolled around, multi-brand retail was totally reinvigorated and people were shopping again. People were wanting to shop in department stores again. And so brands are seeing this. And many of them who stepped away from wholesale at the height of the pandemic, they're actually going back to wholesale now and and beefing up their wholesale strategies again. So why is that? Because as you mentioned, pre-pandemic, you and I discuss this constantly. Department stores have been on a decline since the 80s, essentially, (laughs) since the rise of specialty retail. And market share keeps being taken away from department stores it's not about convenience anymore. It's about an experience. So while there's value in department stores, they are not going to become the main driver of sales for most of these businesses. What happened this year that made brands want to go back to wholesale in a more robust way? It's a confluence of things. A lot of brands honestly have seen e-commerce still do really well and wanting to look at wholesale again and drive even more growth through wholesale. But from a big picture view, one thing that's happened that's very relevant to the resurgence in wholesale is e-commerce has begun to slip in the pace of growth. So it spiked in 2020. And it caused everybody to look at direct and want to go direct. But after a couple months, e-commerce started slowing again, and it's now growing at the same pace as it was in 2019, which is not to say that it's not growing, but it's decelerated. At the same time, whether we're living in a post-pandemic environment or not, people are out and about again. And Brick and mortar retail has seen a real boom. And brick and mortar retail, you know, a lot of it is department stores. Department stores still generate most of their sales through physical stores. So that channel has become very popular again. 
because people want to go shopping in person. And there's another change that I would say is more lifestyle oriented. And, and this may be anecdotal, but there is this sense that when we were on our phones 24 seven at the height of the pandemic, just scrolling Instagram and like seeing all these new brands and being inundated by content from brands, there's some kind of fatigue from that. And so we want to walk into a department store now, or, or some people do, and they want to see curation. They don't want to discover brands on Instagram again, because it's actually a lot of work, right? And so there's this return to curation. There's this return to trust that's happening. And, you know, I did a story, I think it was last year about marketplaces and direct to consumer marketplaces as this emerging model in e-commerce. And I think we're seeing that continue to happen where people no longer just want brand to brand to brand in sort of a very isolated way. They want a sense of curation. I think all of these factors have something to do with the boom of wholesale. And and then also wholesale is very American and there's a real opportunity for growth in America, in the US market right now that international brands are looking at. And wholesale is a way to enter this market. Every time you talk to someone who is a shopper, whether they work in the fashion industry or not, and they shop luxury goods, I did the story at the beginning of the year searching for the next Barneys and people really do miss Barneys. They miss having a lot of options to be able to go try a bunch of stuff on. You hit the nail on the head by saying that it's really about not wanting to have to do the work. You have to do so much work to shop online. And sometimes that can be fun and relaxing, but not everyone wants to spend their free two hours doing that. They might want to walk around the store or or several stores. So it's an interesting return to the old. For sure. I mean, I shop the Essence sale every time it comes around. And I'm always discovering new brands from that sale. A lot of them are international brands. I found out about this one really cool Shanghai label, Shutong, that's hard to find in any other American retailers. But that discovery is still so important. And now I'm relying on this cool third-party retailer to sort of facilitate that discovery. So your lead was this brand, Loeffler Randall, that's been around, I think, 15 years at this point. And they have found early success through wholesale. But during the pandemic, they had huge success online. They opened their own store and they're thriving at direct-to-consumer. What did they say about why they decided to ramp up wholesale again? I spoke to Brian Murphy, who is one of the co-founders of the brand. And what he said was they had noticed that retailers were putting in orders again, that incidentally also sales at the wholesale retailers were going up again. And the channel was just becoming much more robust after everybody thought that it was sort of the end of wholesale, it was sort of the end of department stores. And not just for La Florando, but for a lot of smaller brands, wholesale is actually a really healthy revenue driver because it's a huge order all at once, right? Versus waiting for online sales, which is one transaction after transaction. There's just a lot more regularity with wholesale. You get one giant check all at once. So it's better for cash flow management for smaller brands. So there are a lot of benefits on that front too, where if there's, for whatever reason, a lull in e-commerce, if you have a big wholesale order come in from a Saks or a net au that check can carry the business for a while. They don't get, usually don't get all the money up front, right? They get like 30% up front. Right, right. And they have to wait. So, I mean, it is, it's a little, it's, it's not perfect because you also, a lot of times you have to take out a loan from a factor or whatever. They don't call it a loan, but then you have to take money from a factor who then takes a cut of your sales. But yes, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And, and, you know, some of those terms have improved. So tell me about that. Why is it more beneficial now for La Florandle to be, or a brand like La Florandle, which is, I believe you reported this like close to $50 million this year. So it's like a decent sized business. Why is it beneficial for them to be in wholesale now, not only in terms of the cash flow and the 
general awareness exposure, but also how have the terms changed? What did they used to look like and what do they look like now? For Lothal Randall, they have been able to just negotiate better agreements with their retail partners. So for instance, return to vendor agreements. What that refers to is at the end of the season, when there's merchandise from a brand that hasn't been sold, a lot of the times the wholesale retailer will send back these products and brands don't want that. It's not a great thing for brands to take back last season's merchandise. And so something like this can now be negotiated in a way that's much more favorable to the brand markdown agreements, which means how much can a wholesale retailer promote a certain product. That has become a lot more favorable to the brand. There's just more sort of open, I think, dialogue between the retailer and the brand. I think on the retailer side, a lot of them has had like months to look at their businesses and reassess how they operate. Certainly a retailer like Neiman Marcus had the chance to do this because they were in bankruptcy and they had to take a step back and do it. But what I'm hearing across the board from both brands and retailers is that this vendor-retailer relationship is more collaborative than ever. And it also feels like there's more opportunity for brands as the major brands, the conglomerate owned brands go further and further direct to consumer and don't have as much of a presence in the department stores. I've heard this from a lot of independent players that there's more opportunity to have a bigger presence and to be positioned well in these stores. Have you found this? I know you mentioned in the piece that Nima Marcus has brought in, what, 200 new brands or, or something like that? Yeah, I've heard from other merchandisers that new brands is having a moment. I think people are craving newness. People are craving discovery and they are less loyal to brands. They want to try out new brands. And so I've heard from buyers that a lot of the smaller, younger brands that they're working with turn out to be bestsellers in a season, which is really, really remarkable. And it's a real opportunity also for these retailers to drive sales and acquire customers by partnering with some of these younger brands. In terms of additional leverage, like what are other things that brands can ask for now that they maybe were not able to in the past? A big one is marketing initiatives where the brand and the retailer are working together to promote a certain collection or a certain campaign. They're sharing assets more. I think retailers are much more open to allow the brand to go into the store and have more control over how the collections are presented, whether that's in a real sort of shop and shop set up way or in a much more informal way of just working together to make sure that the brand is represented in the department store, how they want to be represented. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Imran Ahmed, founder and CEO of The Business of Fashion. When I first started writing BOF, it was out of pure passion for this industry and with an eye to how the disruptive forces of digitization, globalization, and consumer shifts would change the way fashion works. 15 years later, we are well on our way to helping to define the fashion business of the future. As I travel the world, some of you ask me, what's the best way to support BOF as we continue to act as your guide during these turbulent times? The best way to support BOF is to support our journalism by joining BOF Professional, the largest community of fashion professionals in the world. A BOF Professional membership gives you access to our agenda-setting insights and analysis, which you won't find anywhere else, plus the opportunity to learn from our talented team correspondents and editors, as well as our wider network of the fashion industry's leading creatives, thinkers, and futurists. Follow the link in the episode notes to learn more. It feels like right now, newness is such an imperative that you can really use that to your advantage. 
For sure. Yeah. I talked to this. It's not a, a huge perfume fragrance company, DS and Durga. They have a lot of exposure in Brooklyn. Really cool company, but they just inked a deal with Bergdorf and they were able to go into Bergdorf and install this like concrete wall. Like it's quite the, it's quite the setup for a, a small, still very much independent brand like DS and Durga. Whereas before the pandemic, they had wholesale exposure. They were doing it through a distributor. But what they had seen is their products just sort of existed on shelves. There was no additional context around the brand. It was just products on a shelf. And they really wanted to change that during the pandemic when, like everybody else, they had a chance to step back and look at their business. And they took wholesale distribution in-house. They stopped working with a distributor and they started shaping these relationships with retailers themselves. And I think it's really working out for them. You also mentioned this move generally. First of all, you said wholesale is a very American thing and it's true in other parts of the world. A lot of these relationships are concession based. So if you go to Le Bon Marche in Paris or Selfridges, Selfridges is a hybrid and I'm sure Le Bon Marche is also. If you go to shop a brand in one of those stores, the sales associate is often hired by the brand, not the retailer. And they have a different type of arrangement the retailer isn't always buying the product directly. And in America, these kinds of concessions have existed, but they are typically very specific and sort of sectioned off. If you go to a Saks or something and you see a Chanel boutique, that's usually a concession. But now it feels like that's moving further into the store and there are different types of arrangements going down. Are you seeing that more that multi brand retailers are offering concession or consignment or different ways to work with smaller brands? For sure. Yeah. In wholesale, one thing that I've heard from everybody is just this openness to explore other models, whether that's the consignment model where brand might be paying quote unquote rent to the department store, but be able to sort of control that environment or drop shipping is another huge one that I've heard from brands, which this is for online marketplaces where instead of the online retailer buying inventory, they allow the brands to sell their products and get a commission on every sale. But it's the brand that's in control of shipping things out and packaging and whatnot. And so we're seeing smaller brands take advantage of that. And they're figuring out what makes sense for them in terms of, okay, so with this retailer, with Net, we'll do wholesale, but with this other retailer, we'll do consignment. And with this other retailer, we'll do drop shipping. And they get to figure out what makes sense for them which is really cool. And and we're also seeing, like you said, smaller brands having the leverage, or I'm not even sure if it's it's a matter of leverage, but there's this openness for wholesale retailers to allow smaller brands to come in and set up shop and shops. I, I did a story about this Brazilian brand, Farm Rio, a few weeks ago. And four years ago, this brand did not exist in the U.S. They were really big in Brazil. But four years ago, before the pandemic, they had very little exposure here. You go to a Neiman Marcus and now you can see these huge Farm Rio shopping shops. And so we're definitely seeing more of these evolving relationships today than we were before the pandemic. You and I have both been covering this dynamic the direct-to-consumer versus wholesale, brands versus multi-brand retailers, how they all work together, how important one is than the other. And it does always feel like these relationships start off on a good foot and then they deteriorate. And then you have a Barney situation where so many brands relied on Barney's for so many years for exposure, for sales, whatever. And then at the end, they were really burned. There were some brands that lost millions of dollars and some that, we know, you can read all the stories, just search on BOF for Barney's. You could read, Kat and I both covered it quite extensively. Definitely check it out. But my point being, how long do you think this honeymoon is going to last? Do you think things have really changed? Or do you think that, especially as we enter a more uncertain economic scenario, Do you think that things are going to get shaky again? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think the industry, I think fashion and retail are just really uh, fickle. Like everything is so uncertain. Everything is so cyclical. It's always going too far, like the retail apocalypse, right? Like this is the end of XYZ in fashion. And the reality is not that. And so it's just really hard to expect what could happen next. I think that where we are today is a really nice place to be for brands and retailers as we're eyeing sort of long-term recovery from the pandemic. In 2021, most, okay, maybe not most, but a lot of retailers saw just insanely good sales numbers, really, really amazing growth. 2021 was just a knockout year for a lot of the brands that I've been speaking with. In 2022, cautiously, we're seeing sales and demand still at a pretty good place. And I think everybody is nervous right now. Everybody is sort of white knuckling it, anticipating some kind of deceleration in demand for apparel. And so I think that's certainly something to keep in mind. And I think brands are just being smarter about this wholesale pivot or the back to wholesale pivot. They're not looking at what they've done in the e-commerce space and just being like, okay, let's forget about that and do wholesale again. Most of them have taken a really tempered approach where during the pandemic, my wholesale sales were like at like 15, 20, 30%. And we want to build that up a little bit because of all the benefits that come from wholesale, like brand awareness and being able to reach new customers. But at the same time, they're still nurturing the direct channel. They're still nurturing e-commerce. And so I think we're at a point where everybody has a more well-rounded business so that if things do go bad again in whichever channel, they can be agile and, and adapt very quickly. Cool. Well, I think it's super interesting. It's always a fun topic and it will be never ending this dance between brands and retailers. And it's great to follow your coverage, Kat. Thank you so much for being here. It's been fun as always. Of course. Of course. I love to shoot the breeze with you, Lauren. It's the best. You have been listening to The Debrief, produced and edited by Emma Clark, Kate Barton, and Eric Bria in the BOF studio. Thanks to everyone involved. I'm Lauren Sherman, and I'll be back next Wednesday with a new episode. Thanks so much for joining us, and be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. You can join BOF Professional today with an exclusive 25% discount on an annual membership covering key industry topics from sustainability to technology to marketing with access to our case studies, live events, and iOS app. To get this special offer and benefit from 25% off of a membership, head to the link in the episode show notes or enter the coupon code DEBRIEF at checkout. Visit businessoffashion.com slash memberships.